Hey, my name is Jara. I teach people how to garden and grow food. Today I want to show you guys my seed starting setup and everything I know. All the knowledge, all the tips and tricks on how to be successful starting everything. All your veggie crops and flowers from seed. I have to say this video is long overdue. If you guys have been following me for some time, you know I'm very passionate about starting things from seed, especially heirloom seeds. And now I sell seeds and plants through my website. So I had to kind of hone in on my seed starting skills to make sure that I was really successful and had great germination. So first off, I'm a huge proponent of starting things from seeds because I do not advocate buying transplants. To me, they're a huge waste of money. I mean, definitely if you're a beginner gardener and you're, you're just getting started, you don't really know how to start things from seeds, um, buying transplants could be useful. It helps you start getting your hands you know, in the ground and getting a feel for gardening and learning some things. But I hope at the end of it, the goal is to learn how to be successful saving your own seed and starting things from seed. I don't know about you, but the last time I went to my local big box store and just looked at the prices of transplants, it just seems like every time I go and look at them, the prices are increasing. I saw a little four pack of lettuce for $6, which is insane to me because lettuce is probably one of the easiest things to grow from seed. And you can buy a pack of seeds for less than $6 and grow hundreds of lettuce plants. Also, it's really quite interesting and amazing just the variety and the selection you have when you're starting things from seed versus buying transplants. So whenever I go to my local nurseries, I have a tendency to say, see the same exact varieties of tomatoes, for example, over and over, specifically Cherokee purple. I see that everywhere and I get bored growing the same things season after season. I definitely like starting from seed because it just opens up the possibility of just more interesting colors and textures. Um, things that maybe you would never get to eat in your life if you didn't grow it yourself. And also it's fun. You get to trade with other gardeners. I personally have found lots of unique and interesting seeds that you can't even buy online if you tried looking for them just because I met a local grower and we traded seeds. And most importantly, to me anyways, something that's really close to my heart is just heirloom conservation. Preserving our heirloom varieties, I just feel like they they're historic. They tell human history. They've been eaten by certain cultures and certain parts of the world for generation after generation and we're losing them. There's some heirlooms that have gone extinct basically. So to me it's just really rewarding to participate in um, growing these heirlooms and preserving them and also teaching other people about them. And I have to say that there truly is something special with growing something generation from generation. Like for example, I hear a lot of people say that they get to grow the same exact tomato variety that was growing in their grandparents' garden, that they remember eating and the taste and flavor and everything growing up in their childhood. And you get to pass those seeds on to your family and friends. And just so you know, um, heirloom seeds are cultivars, varieties that have been grown generation after generation after generation. And you know that when you take seed from that tomato or pepper or whatever, that when you plant it again, you're gonna get the same exact fruit or harvest from it every time, the same shape, color, flavor every time. It's just been stabilized, the genetics have been stabilized. Now, a hybrid is a cross between uh, two heirlooms or whatever, whatever they're crossing with, the two parents. And the seed that that will produce is a mixed bag of unknown genetics. So when you take those seeds, you definitely could plant them and you could grow and get something out of it, but you just don't know what you're gonna get. You don't know what kind of tomato, what flavor, shape, and all of that kind of thing. Maybe you don't care about those things and just having the same exact tomato um, generation after generation. I do, I like to preserve those things and know what I'm getting out of it. Um, sometimes you can plant some hybrid seeds and you'll get a fantastic, really cool tomato out of it. Or sometimes it might not be that great. You just really don't know what you're getting. So I personally really, really like to grow heirlooms. So I know for sure what to expect, what I'm getting, that the quality of that fruit or vegetable is going to be really good. So first off, you got to decide if you need to direct sow, or are you going to start your seeds in containers like what I have here? So basically, I always recommend if you can direct sow, do that every time. If that is possible for you, 
Um, direct sowing just seems to be a more healthier way of growing your plants. Um, you don't have to worry about transplant shock. Like when these are ready to uh, be transplanted into my garden, I have to acclimate them slowly to being outdoors before I just put them into the garden. And they just seem to grow faster. Their root systems aren't constrained by a container. They just can go crazy, grow rapidly. Um, the plants also seem to just be a little bit hardier and stronger, thicker stems, things like that. Um, uh, not as weak as some of the transplants maybe that, that you would be growing. So I always suggest if you can tr uh, direct sow your seeds, then go that route first before you start sowing them in pots and things like that. But of course there are situations where you might have to start your seeds like indoors or in pots and containers for whatever reason. And I'll give you some examples of that. For example, your garden, your climate, it might be too hot or too cold to be starting seeds for whatever particular crop you're thinking about. Um, in that case, it would be uh, advantageous to start your seeds indoors. If you're in a state north of Florida, you might run into the issue that, for example, you don't have enough warm months in a row for a particular growing season to grow a certain type of crop. For example, lufa. Lufa takes a long time from seed all the way to harvest and it needs to be warm that whole time. You might only have like three months out of the entire year in a row where you can actually grow it. So in that case, it would be a good idea to get a head start on sowing your lufa indoors, maybe while it's still winter time. So that way, as soon as the warmer weather comes and you can start transplanting, you get them in immediately and they're already at a decent size and they'll take off for you. Or your situation might be like mine where I have too much heat and I don't have enough months of cold. So to grow things like um, anything in the brassicas family, basically broccoli, cauliflower, that kind of thing, they really need a certain amount of cold so that they will grow properly and then produce a nice big head of broccoli instead of bolting, which means it just goes to its flowering stage. So for me, I have to get a head start on broccolis. Usually I'm planting them or starting them from seed in August so that they are a nice big transplant size in October when we get cooler weather and then they'll grow pretty happy from there. Sometimes what you're growing is just a delicate plant. It's very needy. You have to give it some special attention. In my case, I consider that to be all of my tomatoes, which you see here, tomatoes and peppers. Um, I like to control the situation as much as possible. They are very susceptible to diseases and pests, all sorts of things. So I like to start mine indoors. This is actually my um, porch. It's my screened porch. So they do really well in here. Um, they're protected from high heat or the cold or like the worms that like to chew up the seedlings. Um, so I like to just put them in here. I take really good care of them and control the situation. But there's always a few crops that you cannot start from seed like indoors or in containers. They really do much better direct sown. And an example for that would be root crops like carrots. So carrots will send out a tap root. It's a very long tap root and that is what is going to form into the carrot. So you don't want to like start them in a cup or something to transplant that. You might mess with that tap root and it won't be nice and straight or you could cause it to split. So root crops in general are direct sown at all times. Let's talk about another very important factor when it comes to starting seeds and that's temperature. Some crops need cold temperatures while others need warmth and I'll explain the difference. So this is my broccoli patch. I have rows and rows here of broccoli and cauliflower. This is a cold weather crop that includes things like anything in the brassicas. You have kale, we have uh, bok choy, uh, things that grow really well during the winter time. They have a tendency to be stunted in growth or just die if they're exposed to too much heat. So my situation here in Florida is we have a lot of heat. So I have to start all of these types of crops indoors so they're out of the heat that way they won't get stunted or die off for me. And you know that they've been exposed to too much heat if they stay a tiny little size for a really long time and they don't look like they're changing or growing or anything. Now, they may or may not recover from that. Once the temperatures drop, they might resume growing, but sometimes not. So you basically have to restart. Other crops require some warmth so that they germinate properly. And that would usually be things that you think of as summer crops like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, 
or tropical things like loofah and moringa. So those kind of crops specifically, I start them all in cups, trays, whatever, so that I can put them over heat mats. So I have quite a few heat mats. You probably saw them um, in my seed starting setup there with the shelving unit. Um, so the heat mats really stimulates and warms up the soil temperature for those um, seedlings. And I get really fast germination with that. Some seeds won't even germinate unless the soil is a particular uh, temperature. A good example of this is corn. So here in Florida, we can start growing corn as early as January. <laughs> it doesn't get that cold, so I can start growing corn in January. But I find that when I direct sow my corn seeds into the soil, I get really spotty germination. And I dig out the little seed and I see that it's rotted out. So what that tells me is that the soil was either too cold or still very wet. And so that seed just sat there, it didn't germinate, and instead it just rotted away. So to prevent that from happening, I actually start my corn seedlings in the 72 cell seed trays. And I have a whole YouTube video about growing corn and it'll explain why I do it that way. But that way I can get a head start on my corn growing season and I just pop them into the garden at the end of January when things start to warm up a little bit more. Now let's talk about light. As soon as that seed germinates and it sprouts, the plant is now going to need a certain amount of light so that it will undergo photosynthesis, create its own energy, and continue growing. At that point, I would either set your seeds outdoors if it's safe, if it's not too hot or too cold, and obviously if it's raining. If it's raining, don't put your seeds out there. The rain will wash them away. Or you can put your seeds under grow lights if you're starting them indoors. Um, that's usually what I do, but I don't use traditional grow lights. Instead, I just got a whole bunch of the uh, four foot shop lights. Just make sure that they are 5,000 Kelvins so that you know that's the daylight setting and they work just fine. Now, when it comes to light, as a seed, it's not really necessary, but as soon as it germinates, the plant is going to need light. And it's not getting enough light if you notice that the seedlings are getting really leggy and long. That means they're stretching for a light source. So you need to immediately put them somewhere with um, either the sun or just more light from the grow lights or something like that, and you'll notice that it will grow more properly. Now there are some seeds that are a little bit different than the norm. They have a special kind of structure or a requirement in order to get them to germinate. A great example of that are these ground cherries right here. This is a ground cherry. I love to grow this. It's a perennial plant in my zone and it forms these little orange berries, so to speak cherries, um, that have a really nice fruity flavor. But a lot of people struggle to grow these from seed because they didn't realize that the seeds actually require light to germinate. And some other examples of that, it would be like chamomile or uh, tithonia, Mexican sunflower. Those types of seeds require light. So when you're sowing those seeds, you don't wanna cover them with any soil. You wanna gently press them down into the soil surface and do not cover with soil, just leave them be. Another example of some seeds that have slightly special requirements are things like Moringa, like this tree right here, Lufa, and Morning Glories. They just have a really hard shell. It is hard for me to even germinate these types of crops. But what I do with the Lufa, the Moringa, and the Morning Glory, I soak them in warm water for 24 hours. That'll help soften up that shell. And then I take those seeds and plant them in their little pots or containers. Then I take all of those and put them inside of a box. I then take aluminum foil or plastic wrap, whatever, and seal the top of the box to trap in um, moisture and heat and a lot of warmth. And that really, really helps with germinating those types of seeds fast. Another common situation you might run into are seeds that require a period of cold or what we call cold stratification to initiate the germination process. A great example of that is like this milkweed here or poppies. And generally I see that with flowers and things that grow in the wild and are native to the United States. And if you think about it, these seeds will flower 
and spread their seed all over the environment, wherever they're located. And those seeds will stay dormant through the winter period because they know it's winter time, it's cold. We don't wanna be growing during this time. So then once temperatures warm up, it's kind of a signal to the seeds that it's springtime and now we can start germinating. So sometimes the seeds are totally viable, they're good, they just need some cold, um, a period of cold in order to germinate. So in those cases, I just put the seeds in a Ziploc bag and I put them in my fridge for a couple weeks. And how would you know this about all these different seeds? Which ones require cold stratification? Which ones have a hard shell and you need to soak them in water? Um, a lot of that comes from experience, but I also highly recommend whenever you're thinking about growing something to research the heck out of it. Watch YouTube videos, read articles about it, and you'll usually run into those tips and kind of learn the specifics about all of those crops. Now, I am a seed seller, and on my website, I also make it a huge point to point out <laughs> whenever something is special and requires like cold stratification or sun to germinate. So let's talk about soil. Uh, when I was a beginner gardener, I used to just take soil out from my garden or use compost and then fill all my seed trays and cups with that. And of course, things would germinate, but it wouldn't be as good of a germination as what I get now when I'm using a sterile seed starting mix, a mix made for seed starting. And um, I'm always gonna say, use what you have access to. Like if you don't wanna go out and buy, you know, sterile seed starting mix, then don't use what you have. But just know that your germination rates and things are going to be affected a little bit. Uh, here in Florida, we have a lot of pathogens. They float in the air, we have a lot of humidity and rain, they proliferate. Um, the compost in my soil here has a lot of good and bad um, pathogens. And probably the number one that affects all of my seedlings or you know, most of the time when they die is like dampening off. So it's uh, like a mold that will grow on the surface of the seed starting pot or whatever. And it basically like eats at the stem and then ends up killing your seedling. So that has a tendency to happen a lot <laughs> in my area where there's a lot of humidity. Um, I found that when I switched over to a, a sterile seed starting mix though, that really, really helped reduce the incidence of dampening off and some other things. Um, so right now I'm using a seed starting mix from a company called ProMix. I did see bags of it in my local you know, Home Depot. I've seen it there a couple times. But if you can't find it or it's just too expensive, you can make your own. And I did that for many, many years. So basically I would just take a big wheelbarrow and I would put equal parts of peat moss and perlite or maybe vermiculite if you can't find the perlite. And then I would also put in some worm castings. And worm castings is an organic, um, very natural, very light uh, fertilizer that will help your seedlings get to a good start. And I don't measure anything. I just mix it all in there and it's fine. What you want is a seed starting mix that is sterile and very fluffy. That will help your seedlings not die from some kind of <laughs> disease or mold or whatever. And the fluffiness will help the root systems really develop. You might also notice that a lot of the seed starting mixes that are light and fluffy that contain peat moss specifically are kind of hydrophobic. When you're watering them or trying to make them moist, the water just kind of slides off from it. So it's really important that you soak these seed pots or whatever that have the the seed starting mix in it very well to make sure that they are picking up that water and they're fully soaked through before you put your seeds in there and then after they're nice and soaked through you're also going to want to press down on the soil and basically get rid of any air pockets there might be so let's talk about watering and keeping your seedlings evenly moist so they're going to need water to soften up their shells and germinate so Keep them evenly moist, but you don't want to oversaturate it where they're sitting in water. A good thing is to let them dry out completely before you water them again. And just as a professional seed grower, I like to put my seedlings or their cups in these, these are 10 inch by 20 inch uh, trays that don't have holes in it so that you could fill the tray with water and then the soil in these cups will just through osmosis pick up the water and you know properly nicely evenly um, moisten up your seedlings a very important tip with watering whether it be your seedlings or even outdoors in your garden you never want to wet the leaves if you wet the leaves that'll cause a lot of different pathogens to start growing on it and spreading especially powdery mildew so if you can't avoid it don't water the leaves or don't water 
overhead on your seedlings. So that's why I like to use these trays and they just soak that water through the bottom. Um, it's a very common technique as well if you grow house plants. All right, so let's talk about choosing the correct pot size. If you decided to start your seeds indoors or in containers or whatever, um, choosing the right pot size is very important. I, for one, don't like to waste my time potting things up. So a lot of times gardeners will start their things in like the 72 cell seed trays. And then once they get big enough for that, they have to be potted up into something bigger. So they're not yet ready to be transplanted into the garden. Therefore, you just have to pot them up and, and basically do the work twice. So I like to start things off in a nice big size container to begin with and avoid the whole potting up thing. This is kind of like my general guideline on how to choose the correct pot size. So if the crop is something big, like tomatoes or like loofah, things that get really, really big quickly, um, you're gonna wanna use something bigger. I love to use um, these solo cups. So my tomatoes and things like that will usually take anywhere between six to eight weeks um, to be big enough and ready to be like transplanted into the garden. So this solo cup will hose, uh, house <laughs> my tomatoes for about eight weeks. At the eight week mark, it's a nice big transplant. If you you know lift it out of its cup, you'll see that the root system is fully developed throughout the entire cup and it, it really needs now to be planted in a permanent spot. If it's like a medium sized plant, like broccoli or cauliflower, sunflowers, zinnias, like the flowers that get really, really big, um, I recommend using a four inch pot at minimum. I find that, especially with um, the sunflowers, if they are in a tiny little cell for a long time and get root bound, it'll really stunt their height and they'll stay short. And it, especially when it comes to growing like the bigger size sunflowers, like the mammoth, um, gray stripe or something like that, that get 15 feet tall. If I don't start them in a bigger um, container, they, they get stunted. So I recommend the four inch, at least a four inch pot size for those crops. Now for these smaller crops, like the lettuces and bok choys, things that are smaller when they're ready to be transplanted out in the garden, these 72 cell seed trays were great. And I know they're ready to transplant when their root system pretty much overtakes the entire cell. And just a reminder guys, keep your seedlings out of the rain. Um, here in Florida, we get like monsoon rains. So there's times where I'll take all my seedlings and carry them outside so they just get a little bit stronger sunlight. And then I forget about it and the rain comes and it just washes them all out. So that really, really sucks when that happens that you put in all this work and effort just to have uh, have it wash out. So that's why I start a lot of my seeds in this, this setup here on my screen porch. I know they're protected from you know the rain and everything like that. Now let's talk about fertilizing your seedlings. It's optional, you don't have to fertilize them, but I find that when I do, they grow faster and they're much healthier. You'll notice that when a seedling sprouts, it'll have these initial two little leaves that aren't the what the actual final like adult mature leaves look like. Those are called cotyledons. Those are just, the plant is very quickly just putting something out there so it can start photosynthesis and making its own energy. Then after those two cotyledons comes the first set of what we call true leaves. And I'll show you what that looks like. Um, this is a tomato. And as you can see, those little bottom ones right there, those are the cotyledons that came out. And now these are the first set of true leaves, which is what tomato leaves actually look like. So once your plants, and this is applicable, not just to tomatoes, but peppers, here's a pepper right here. Same thing. You have the cotyledons right there, and this is the first sets of actual true leaves. Um, once they get those first set of true leaves, it's a prime time for you to start the fertilizing process. Now for seedlings, I recommend a liquid fertilizer because granular stuff takes time to break down and these seedlings need to access those nutrients quickly so they can grow. I like to use the liquid fertilizers. Um, this one is from Fox Farms, it's called Grow Big and it's specially formulated to help you know seedlings and plants grow in size. But no matter what liquid fertilizer you end up using, look at the directions and whatever the dose that it you know recommends, you're gonna do half of that for your seedlings. And in general, once I transplant my seedlings into the garden, I start switching to a more balanced fertilizer. Like with these tomatoes, I really like to use Espoma brand's Tomato Tone. And then once they start flowering, once things go into the flowering stage, they're gonna start producing fruit or vegetables. 
Um, you're going to want to switch to something a little bit more based on the potassium and phosphorus side of things, not so much the nitrogen. The nitrogen promotes a lot of leafy green growth, which is great at the beginning, but if a plant gets too much nitrogen, it actually takes away from its production and producing uh, flowers and fruit. So once you start seeing flowers, once my tomatoes start flowering or I notice my peppers have little flowers on them, I'm going to switch to something heavier with phosphorus and potassium. And I so happen to also use another product from Fox Farms. It's not this one though, but it's called uh, Tiger Bloom. And that really supports um, a lot of flower production, which means you're gonna get more vegetables and fruit. If you're enjoying this video and learned something new, make sure you subscribe to my channel. That way you get notified of any time I post new videos. I am pushing really hard to create grow guides for all the different kinds of crops and really teach you guys how to grow your own food. And make sure you check out my website, jarasgarden.com. I have a lot of the seeds and plants that I talk about and show in my videos available there for purchase if you wanna grow the same exact ones in your own garden. Plus, I have a whole blog section where I post monthly grow guides so you know what seeds and things you need to start and when to transplant them. Your support is greatly appreciated and it really motivates me to create more gardening content just like this one. All right guys, so let's talk about the last thing here that's very important when starting seeds and that is when to start your seeds. Now in general, this can be generalized for the majority of the United States, except for Florida <laughs> and I'll get there soon. But if you're in a state north of Florida, you can pretty much follow the guidelines or the directions on the seed packets that you're buying. And normally it'll say something like, start these seeds X amount of weeks before or after your first or last frost. So your first frost, and this is for everyone, is the first frost that comes through your area or your garden of the winter season. And the last one is gonna be the last frost that goes through your area, um, usually in early spring. And that'll be the last frost, and now it's spring and everything is warm, right? So, you know, in states north of Florida, that's generally how it works. It's a good, um, you know, starting point. But in Florida, or zones like 9, 10, and 11, we don't really get frosts like that. Um, zones like 11 don't even get a frost. So how do you figure this stuff out? First off, if you don't know your frost dates, please go check out a website called plantmaps.com. You put in your zip code, it's gonna tell you a lot of useful information for your garden, such as what garden zone you're in, and what is on average your first frost date and your last frost date. So here in Florida, like I said, we don't really get frost like that. So the directions don't really apply so much to us. And that can make it really, really frustrating, especially as a new gardener in Florida. Or the most common thing that I hear is that you were an awesome gardener when you lived in Michigan or New York or whatever, and then you decided to come down to Florida to retire and now nothing is growing for you. I promise you guys, it's not you, okay? You just have to get acclimated to the, the way Florida is in our weather here. For example, all of the states north of us usually grow your tomatoes like spring and summer. You're getting these wonderful harvests of tomatoes. Not the case here in Florida. It's actually the opposite. The best time of the year to grow tomatoes in Florida is fall, winter, and spring. We get so much heat that that, that kills off my tomato plants. The heat of summer is what kills off my tomato plants not the cold or the waves of or the cold fronts like in states north of us the cold fronts come through and that's what kills off your tomato plants so it's a little bit like the opposite and backwards of what everyone else in the country is doing and it took me a while i have to say it took me a couple years to learn it by experience right when to start seeds for things and you know they were successful they grew i was able to get a nice harvest but I have to say by far the number one resource is connecting with other Florida gardeners. Find them on YouTube, join, um, I can't tell you how many Facebook groups I'm a part of that are specific for Florida. You can ask questions, you can ask people what they're doing. Um, you can go to my website. I have a, um, a blog section with grow guides for every single month and I pretty much tell you when to start seeds for certain things, when it's time to transplant them into the garden. But nothing beats your own experience. Every garden is unique. Um, I talk about my garden and what works in my garden, but that might not be the case for someone just 10 minutes down the street from me. Um, there's so many factors that play into it. So by far, take notes, have a garden journal, 
take notes of when you started seeds for things and when you started harvesting them. Um, I promise you, uh, I mean, it's a learning curve, but you'll get it and it'll be the best information you could possibly gain from your garden. And my last tip for you guys, especially for the Florida gardeners, if you're still not being successful, you know, starting seeds, backtracking from your first or last frost date, you can kind of take a look at the ideal growing temperatures for something. For example, lettuce. The ideal growing temperatures for lettuce is 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So go to the website plantmaps.com, put in your zip code. At the very bottom, it'll have a chart and it'll show the average minimum and average maximum like growing or like temperatures um, per month. So I would there, therefore go there and look at my garden and every single month and I would decide, okay, these are the months where these temp the maximum growing temperatures are between 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Therefore, that's the best time for the lettuces and things like that to be growing and being in my garden. They're gonna survive and they're gonna do very well. And then whatever month that might be, for me that falls in the month of November and, and December and January, you're gonna backtrack from there X amount of weeks to either start your seeds um, from containers or whatever, to transplant them into the garden like in November when it's the ideal temperatures. Or if you're gonna direct sow seeds, you're gonna direct sow them in the month where those ideal temperatures exist. Another example is like all these broccolis and stuff here. Their ideal temperatures is 65 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. For me, that falls into um, October, November, December, all the way up until April is when things start getting in the 80s and above. So I have that whole window there to start seeds, get them into the garden, grow them, and then harvest those heads of broccoli really quick. Um, I like to get those crops into the garden, usually like at the end of October when things have really cooled down. So I'm gonna backtrack. For broccoli, you wanna give them eight to 12 weeks of growing time before they're ready to be transplanted. So I'm starting those like in August and stuff like that. But August is still a really hot month outside, so I have to make sure that I just grow them indoors and kind of control the temperatures a little bit. I'll give you one last example are tomatoes. So tomatoes for me typically take six to eight weeks from seed to get to a nice transplant size. My target is to get tomatoes in by the month of September. Usually the end of September is when I'm transplanting them and putting them all in my garden. So I'm going to backtrack eight weeks from September, which lands me in July. So I am starting my seeds for tomatoes in July. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed all these tips and tricks to being successful starting seeds. If you've tried anything or you have a technique, a method or a product or something that has really taken your seed starting skills to another level, please comment below, let us know. I am always learning new things. So I'll probably be updating this grow guide or putting more out in the future as I change things and just tweak them a little bit. But I'm always open and you should be too as a gardener, just always open to new suggestions and tips. Um, I am learning new things every day.